We're here outside the State House on a beautiful sunny winter day here uh, to talk about what was one of the largest projects we've certainly undertaken with this building uh, that happened uh, over the course of the, the spring, the summer, and the fall here. And that was uh, a major overhaul to the, the drum of the dome and the dome itself and a new statue of agriculture put uh, atop the dome here at the State House. And uh, it all started in the spring. In, in uh, late April, the uh, original, the statue, Series 2, uh, Dwight Dwinell statue, came down. And that kind of was the kickoff to the whole process. Um, over the spring into the summer, some huge steel girders were attached at the base of the drum of the dome here to hold the scaffolding that covered the entire dome uh, for the, the most part of the summer into early in the fall. And a lot of people see we have the new statue, we have the new gold leaf on the dome, but there was a lot more to the project than that. And that, that we'll kind of work our way up. The first uh, piece that was worked on was the drum itself. Uh, so the area below the, the dome where all the windows are, uh, that's gotten a new paint job. It was, it was scraped down, the old paint was scraped down to refusal, and uh, new paint was, was added there. Uh, the windows were all taken out, all 12 of those windows uh, in the drum were taken out and sent off to be uh, conserved and touched up. Those that were, had broken or missing panes of glass were replaced with uh, era appropriate glass, so mid 19th century glass, uh, and they were again scraped down, touched up, and, uh, and conserved a little bit. Uh, so the old windows, but with a, a new finish to them in there. Inside the dome itself, uh, there is a staircase uh, that used to be quite terrifying to take to the top of the dome and that was uh, brought up to um, standards and is now much sturdier, uh, much safer and uh, much easier for maintenance and other folks who need to get up to the top of the dome from the inside to get up there. Um, the other piece that happens when you have an almost 160 year old building is that the roof itself had some leaks um, so they did uh, attack that problem as well. The uh, copper on top of the dome is the original 1859 copper. Uh, we suspect that we have one of the oldest roofs in the state of Vermont. And uh, again, as you might imagine, there was some, uh, some leakages that happened there. So they, they took their time and went through and made sure they, they took care of all that. So there will be no more water uh, inside the drum of the dome uh, when it gets real rainy. And then the gilding itself, uh, that's what a lot of people see. It's this amazing resplendent golden dome, uh, especially on a day like today. It's incredibly bright. Um, the process of, of taking the leaf off, we had gilders that came uh, from a company called Evergreen in New York City. Uh, that, that handled that project for us and they actually removed the original gold leaf uh, with a chemical solution so it comes off more in a slop in a bucket than it does in terms of actual leaf that's scraped off. Uh, once they got that down to the original copper again, it was really interesting. We were able to see there were some areas where the original red paint from pre-1906 uh, was actually still there in, in places. And we did ask that they leave that up there so that, it, that we know that it's under there, under the new leaf now, and perhaps in another 100 years or, or 50 years or who knows, uh, someone will actually be able to see that as well. But once they got down to the original copper, they painted a, uh, a yellowish gold colored primer on there and then put what's called sizing on which is sort of an adhesive that would sit for about 12 hours and then they would lay the, the gold leaf over it. And the gold leaf uh, is just as it sounds, it's leaf, it's thinner than a piece of paper. Uh, it was either in very small squares or in, or in small rolls and they went bit by bit on the scaffolding all the way around and they would put that on and, and rub it on and it adheres to the, uh, to the sizing that's on there. And then when they're done with all that they take um, a piece of lamb's wool and they do what's called burnishing and they kind of rub it down and it takes the loose pieces off and it gives it that that real shine it sort of polishes it up so that was the the actual gilding process which took quite some time as you you might imagine um, we suspect because this was the first time that we've gilded the dome when it actually had uh, the scaffolding all the way up that it is um, probably the best job that's ever been done in terms of the work on the dome and the gilding itself because people were able to get right up against it and and really see and we were able to to keep an eye on it and go through a few times and, and see if there are any spots that had been missed. Um, so a really superb job of, of gilding that was done on the dome uh, and we do expect this to last. Uh, the last gilding lasted about 41 years and I say lasted it certainly was well overdue for gilding but um, this was uh, done so well that we're hoping to get another 40 or 50 years out of this. And then the last piece that was added here was the new statue of agriculture which um, sits beautifully atop the dome. That went up late in the fall here. Uh, it was done by 
two Vermont artisans um, here in the central Vermont area. Uh, Jerry Williams, who's a Barry Granite sculptor, did the initial clay model. And then Chris Miller, who's also a granite sculptor, but had about two decades of wood carving on a large scale experience behind him, did the actual carving of this 14 and a half foot statue. Um, we took, and I think we talked about this in, in the spring on one of these shows, but we um, made our best effort to reproduce um, Larkin Mead's original 1859 uh, statue of agriculture, um, while also giving a little bit of artistic license um, to these incredible artists. And this was kind of the cherry on top. This was the last piece, even after the gilding was done. Um, you know, it was, it was beautiful to look at the building, but you could certainly see that something was missing. Uh, so the, the dome has gone through a, a major overhaul. We're, we're very, very excited and very proud of the work that was done. It, it, it's more than we ever hoped for. And um, again, with this new shiny uh, bright leaf that's on there that we anticipate is going to last for decades and decades, and this new statue that we anticipate after each of the last two lasts about 80 years will hopefully get us at least 100 years. Um, this should all hold up for a while. So if you're in Montpelier and you haven't been by the State House in a while, I would strongly encourage you to take a drive down State Street and take a look at, uh, at all we've done here with the Dome. Good morning. My name is Patty McCoy. I represent the towns of Pulteney and Ira, Rutland One, and this year I am serving my first term as the House Minority Leader, which is a challenge. We only have, we've coming back with less numbers than we had in the past, but I'm still optimistic that we can work together in the House as a whole to get things done that are good for Vermonters as a whole. We are today going to um, be dealing with the Budget Adjustment Act. We heard about it yesterday. Um, for the most part, our uh, House Appropriations Committee has done a wonderful job. I think 95% of what we'll hear is uh, the governor's asks in the adjustment with a few tweaks. Uh, the largest one is retiring one of our loans for health care, uh, the OPEB loan which is $22.5 million, which will save $300 million over the course of the next 20 years or so, which uh, that's, I'm very pleased to see that we're actually turning towards uh, trying to finance what we're supposed to be financing. We've made commitments to people for their health insurance, for their retirements, and we need to really fully fund those. And we have not in the past, and we're trying to um, make right on those right now. Uh, other issues, I'm on transportation. I've been put on the transportation committee and try very hard to get in there each and every day. Some things pull me away, but I try very hard to be there. And um, we're just g going through each agency's budgets and asks and just kind of gives us a sense of what uh, the Agency of Transportation does as there are four new members on that committee, me included. So um, I hope it's going to be a great session. I'm optimistic, and I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jim Harrison. I'm a state representative from the town of Chittenden. My district also includes Killington, Bridgewater, and Menden. Um, pleased to be here. We're now in week four. Time is starting to fly, uh, especially when you consider sessions uh, typically last 17 or 18 weeks. So uh, we're now getting into that part of the session where we're actually starting getting down to the nitty-gritty of issues and uh, therefore um, in the next few weeks you'll see really what the hot topics are going to be of the session. One of the bills I introduced this year is to add potentially more transparency but also some efficiency as issues each year get more and more complex. I believe we need to do whatever we can to make ourselves efficient, to save time, and one of the things that uh, I'm looking at is electronic roll call voting. It may sound like a simple thing, changing something we've been doing for 200 years is never easy. So it's, a, it's a, an issue, a process that may take a little time for people to buy into but basically when we do a roll call vote we methodically announce every person's name record their vote takes 15 minutes give or take each time we do that as we get into where there's amendments uh, big bills uh, there are invariably a lot of roll calls um, if we can cut that down get the same result in terms of transparency in say five minutes um, yeah, you still have to allow a couple minutes for people to get to their seats if they're out in the hallway um, that to me would be a big plus 
maybe, just maybe, we can be more transparent to our voters on um, what the issues are or get out a few days earlier and save the taxpayers money and um, let us get on to our lives. So anyhow, that's uh, one of the issues. Hopefully we'll, we'll take it up um, and, and go from there. But uh, anyhow, pleased to be here. And uh, as always, uh, Jim Harrison um, from the town of Chittenden. Thank you. Hello, Vermont. This is Senator John Roz Rogers from Essex Orleans. I live in Glover, Vermont, about 25 miles from the Canadian border. One of the issues I would like to address this year are several things relating to the firearms law that passed last year in S-55. In my perspective, it was poorly put together because it did not go through a committee process. It was built by amendments on the floor, and generally when stuff is built by amendments on the floor, there are some oversights. The first oversight I'd like to point out is that the law, in effect, uh, ban firearm competitions that have been happening around, for, around Vermont for generations. This is hundreds of thousands of dollars in economic benefit to Vermont and Vermonters by folks who have never caused one single problem in Vermont over the years. These are serious competition shooters uh, that have safety in mind all the time and I think that was an oversight. Number two, uh, it inadvertently banned over 60 firearms from being imported into Vermont. And last year that came to light when the city of Montpelier wanted to order new service handguns and couldn't get them shipped to Vermont because they were illegal. Um, and one of the things that bothers me the most about the legislation is that I can pass my rifles on to my children and grandchildren, niece and nephews and other members of my family, but I cannot pass on legally the magazines that go with those rifles. And I believe that we should be able to pass on our legally owned property to our family members and I am trying to correct that. We are all in favor of gun safety and trying to keep Vermonters safe, but no good ever came from taking rights away from good people. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Maslin, representative from Thetford. I also represent Norwich, Sharon, and Stratford. And I'd like to talk a little bit about telecom uh, expansion, particularly fiber optic net network expansion. And one of the issues that's come up over the last couple of years that I'm very interested in has to do with something called Make Ready. Make Ready is both a process and an activity that has to do with putting the uh, fiber optic cable on utility poles that are sometimes owned by the power companies and sometimes by, for instance, Fairpoint, now Consolidated Communications or other people. Um, in some cases, poles may be jointly owned. But the issue is that Vermont statutes require you, the utility pole owners to make space available on the poles for new fiber optic um, cable. We're glad for that. Um, incidentally, I have been part of EC Fiber for, well, since we got started, which hence from whence comes from my, my perspective on this. Um, and as I said, um, make ready is both a process and an activity. The activity is actually making space on the pole, which may mean moving um, existing uh, telephone lines or, for instance, Comcast or Verizon moving their stuff to make room for the, for the new deployment. It's also a process because the applicant, EC Fiber or one of the new telecom startups, um, files for a license. Um, and there is it's somewhat of an involved process, but the poll owner and all the people up on there are supposed to have 120 days to do an assessment and get all the work done so that the new um, fiber optic cable can be installed. But we found over the last couple of years that sometimes it takes various people 120 days to begin thinking about it before they actually do the work that is required of them. Um, and it, what happens is they've already been paid. The, the, the uh, poll license requires substantial amounts of money and there's a license for every single poll that is um, part of this build out. And so um, we wonder or would speculate that the delays might even be deliberate. You know, I mean, why let a competitor 
move into the market, even if the competitor provides better service at a reasonable cost. But anyway, so in order to remedy that situation, there is something afoot called One Touch Make Ready, where a licensed contractor, approved by everybody involved, would go out to the poles and move everything all at once, instead of having one contractor go move, say, Fairpoint's lines, and another contractor go another day and move Comcast lines, and da da da. And in some cases, actually, it's the same contractor, it just goes out on different days. So, one touch make ready is a process where somebody goes out, does the work, and we all go about our business and are much the better for it. So, one touch make ready is a very part and parcel of a bill that I've introduced, which would require the uh, department to amend its rules to allow for or require one touch make ready and simultaneously the department has filed a motion with the public utility commission which would do very nearly the same thing so uh, we are very grateful those of us who are involved with with uh, telecom expansion that both of these efforts are moving simultaneously and we hope, hope sincerely and are quite confident that they'll succeed thank you Hi, this is Charlie Kimball reporting from the State House. Uh, I am the representative from Woodstock, representing Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth, Vermont. So I serve on the House Commerce and Economic Development Committee. And it's my second term in the House, and now I've been assigned back to that committee. I'm now a ranking member, which means I am the kind of uh, vice chairman in waiting, is what the real title of that is. Um, but it's great because I get to help uh, invite different speakers to testify on the issues that are important. Uh, to the state. And right now we're working really on workforce development issues. Uh, the big uh, problem that we face in economic development across the entire state is having a shortage of workers in a variety of positions. It doesn't matter if it's entry level, it could also be in a professional level or even at, the, at a senior level. So it's difficult with a state with a, a declining or stable population. Most of our Areas throughout Vermont have declining populations both in the school age and also in other ages too, uh, except that we are increasingly older. Uh, we are now the third oldest state. We used to be the second and New Hampshire has now replaced us as the second oldest state in the country. Um, so it is an issue that we have to deal with. Uh, one of the things we need to think about is the governor has proposed plans in order to attract more people to move to the state of Vermont. Is that the right way to do it or do we need to adjust through the size of government to reflect the number of residents who are still here? So there are two different philosophies, two different approaches, and we are engaging the administration and trying to figure out are their plans really feasible in order to attract people to uh, move to the state and stay here. So there was the $10,000 the grant program, the, the remote worker program that passed the legislature last year, it actually took effect January 1st of 2019. And that pays $10,000 to people uh, for their qualified expenses uh, to move to Vermont. But their job that they have to bring with them is not a Vermont-based job. And that's not the biggest issue we have, as I said earlier. It, the issue we have is really focusing on those companies and those employers that need to find people to work in their, their businesses. So that's where we have the gap, and this is something else we're working on. The gap is people can't find the jobs they want, and employers can't find the employees they need. And so there's this big disconnect. Uh, there are some very good jobs in the state of Vermont, but uh, people don't, and we don't have enough people to actually fill those jobs, and uh, there's also the perception of young people in Vermont that they can't find a job that's going to be fulfilling and rewarding and actually make the money. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're looking at is how do we actually give the workforce the skills they need to qualify for those jobs that are either open now or will be open sometime in the future. And we're directing all of our energies in house commerce and uh, economic development towards that end. So that's the report. Hi, I'm Senator Alice Nitka. I live in Ludlow and represent Windsor County, all the towns in Windsor County, as well as Mount Holly in Rutland County and Londonderry in Wyndham County along with um, Allison Clarkson and Dick McCormick. Uh, of course, there's always a lot going on here at the State House in the beginning of the year. New people, a lot of new people in the House, new people in the Senate. I think the, um, the youngest new member in the House is a fellow who's, I think, 22 or 23 from Sutton, Vermont. And we have a new, very young person, not very young, new young person in the Senate. Um, 
Corey Parent, who was formerly in the House, and I'm not sure of his age. I don't know. If, anyway, he's in his, he may be 28, I think. Anyway, so it's nice to have these younger people here because people are always mentioning, well, we need some new younger people. And yes, we have them. It's great. So some of the things, everybody's learning the ropes, where to go, what, what rooms are where, how do you operate in terms of the protocol, to behave yourself. And uh, so it's a lot of pomp and circumstance in the beginning and a lot of learning the ropes. One of the, th of course, in the beginning, the governor gives his budget address, which we had um, last week. And one of the issues that we were working on today in my committee, one of my committees, I'm on appropriations and judiciary. And one of the issues we were looking at in the budget adjustment, which is the budget from last year that um, is going through until June 30th of this year. And at this time of year, when we come back, we do an adjustment to that budget. In other words, there might be some areas where more money needs to be spent than we put in the budget and in other places where not all of the money that we put in was needed or will be needed. And so we might move that around and put it into the budget adjustment to help out in another area. And one of the areas that's new that the um, governor mentioned in his budget address is the issue of lead testing in our schools. And what happened was the health department had a, did a little pilot, it was really a random thing with regard to um, wa the water in schools being tested. It was 15 schools and they found out that there was lead in the water of I think, anyway, a good number of those schools there was some lead in the water and then in others there wasn't lead in every fountain but it was in some places and the remediation for that could be in some schools that um, maybe you would not use that faucet anymore but you'd use other faucets and you might fill them from a, a fill spout to provide water to another part of the school or, or they'd block off that drinking fountain and you use the other ones. So. In terms of finding the lead, it can be in the faucets, the, and it's um, could be fr it's usually from the lead solder. Of course, there might be some schools that have lead in a lot of the pipes, so that's a much more costly remediation if you do that. But it could be. I think they the health department predicts now that the average cost will be about thirteen to fifteen hundred dollars per school, unless you had the big time problem of all the pipes have problems. Or if you had water coming into the school from another source that had problems in that water. But anyway, so we were looking at that and the cost of it and how it will be done. And the cost is, a, is up there in terms of it, to do the remediation. I mean, it's not excessive when you think of big dollars, but there, there are, um, we have 422 schools in the state. And of those, I'm forgetting the exact number, a hundred and some are private independent schools and they will be included in the testing. I mean it's all children in the state of Vermont so they're, the health department is including all of them in what's going to be the testing. And the governor gave a charge to the health department and the, and the legislature to do that within a year rather than having it spread out over a couple of years and that's certainly a good idea. So there will be some a lot of the testing will be done by school personnel. They'll be trained by the health department um, to know how to do it, how to report it, and then what happens next. So we're working on the money for it. And it, it's quite interesting because we looked at some bottled water that you might be, right at the very moment, as it turns out, uh, the state house water has to be boiled to drink, as does the water around Montpelier, because there was a big water main break the other day. Of course, some unfortunate families have no water, neither did National Life, which is a very big business and has a lot of the state offices there. They didn't have any, so they all got sent home. But we here are having to boil our water, no big deal. We, you know, there's no place here to boil water in the building, so you just, you can get bottled water, you can bring your own, or you can do whatever, or you can drink it if you're really not, if you don't care. <laughs> so and that's what's going on here. But anyway, uh, of course, a lot of this will address the issue of the lead in schools, lead in the water, but I mean there's, I forget the exact number, but it's all of the faucets 
that need to be checked. It's not just the water coming in from the main line that has to be checked. So that's where the that's where the work comes in is checking all those faucets and then reporting it and then deciding what we'll do. So what I was saying was that we looked at some water bottles, you know, because you might be providing water out of a bottle. Turns out there's a little bit of lead in that water. Hmm, it's a little bit of a surprise. Um, not much, but you know, it's there. And of course, many homes uh, around the state still have have lead in their water as well. I mean, nobody, but we shouldn't have to have it in school. So you know, no nobody at home is. It would be you know. Anyway, it's there. A lot of people have private wells, and there's lead pipes. So I can remember that we had lead pipes coming from our well to our house. Wouldn't recommend it, but. <laughs> It's not uncommon, but it's not good for young children at all. So anyway, that's what's going on in terms of the lead business. A lot of people have asked about it. Um, and as I say, it will include the independent and private schools as well. Whether it will include the remediation costs for those schools is another matter. That's something to come up on the next round of looking at the money. So anyway, a lot going on here. Um, Anyway, we have series, as you probably know, our new statue on the top of the building. Doesn't have the lightning round, uh, rods on her crown, but they're inside her body. And I understand quite a few people, I think the pages went to the tower, the dome today. They couldn't go out, of course, but to see what the inside looks like up there. So, hope to talk to you again sometime, and thanks, Rick. Mm -hmm.